get started real shortly. I know there's a few folks that are probably going to be joining in and this evening. I uh, just want to introduce myself. My name is Nancy Howell. I'm one of the board members of Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And um, we also have several other board members that I'm going to be introducing. Um, but, uh, you know, we have our bird quiz. Maybe some of you have tried it out. And we'll be going over the answers real shortly. I'm glad that everyone could be here this evening. And like I say, there's probably going to be a few other folks checking in uh, for, this, uh, for this program. Um, if you uh, are unmuted, if the little microphone symbol is not red or has the X through it, the mark through it, Make sure your, your microphone is muted so, so we don't hear background noise. Um, also, uh, there's a, a place for, for questions in the chat, so you can click on the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. I think that's where most of our chat icons are. And type in your, your question. Uh, it could be regarding the program uh, or during the program. So uh, again, glad that you're here this evening. All right. So we had a couple, four questions on our February bird quiz. We're going to be going over those in just a minute or so. And um, let's, uh, let's move along, Betsy, if you could do the next slide, please. Yay, so it's already Tuesday, February 2nd. And uh, again, our meeting is being recorded. So if you would like to listen to it again, please do. Uh, it'll be up probably within the next day or so. Uh, our speaker will begin at 8 o'clock. Next slide, please. That's me. Next. And I, welcome every, I welcomed uh, everybody, but I do want to mention we have several board members that are going to be speaking with us this evening. And I'm going to mention their names. Some folks are here this evening, some folks are not. Michelle Brocious will be joining us and talking with us a little bit later. Gloria Ferris will also be joining us a little bit later. Kurt Miske will be joining us. Karu Savoni. Marianne Romito, is, I know, is, is watching as well. And Bruce Missing. So I just wanted to mention all of our board members. Uh, some are, are with us this evening and some not. I also want to mention uh, Betsy O'Hagan, who is our digital uh, a marketing strategist, and she's going to be doing a little bit of announcing uh, during our, our uh, introductions and, and meeting just before the program. All right. Yep. Hey, Betsy. All right. Uh, let's zip to see how well we did with those, those answers to the bird quiz. All right. So the first question was, have prairie chickens ever been found in Ohio? And yes, obviously they have, because in archaeological records, Prairie chicken bones uh, have been found in archaeological sites, so they were probably consumed by native peoples. But a Hopewell platform pipe in the form of a prairie chicken was also found. Betsy, if you could zip to that next slide. There it is. Um, and I, I like it because um, it tells us what it is. There's a label by it. Uh, but I, I can see it, that beautiful platform pipe in the Hopewell were known for their they're gorgeous pipes, and you can see this bird has a little crest on its head, the little pouch at the throat, the tails up, and then the markings on the wings. So I think it's, it's a pretty good rendition of the ground chicken. Again, for those of you who just came in, make sure that you're muted. Make sure your microphone is on mute. Okay. All right. Um, so, what's the best um, habitat for a prairie chicken? Well, um, prairies, obviously, native grasslands. Although populations now uh, are using some agricultural pasture lands and fields, uh, but of course, uh, uh, prairies, short grass prairies, uh, and native grasslands were the preferable uh, uh, habitats. And the communal, the communal display ground used by males is called a lek. Okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that our speaker this evening will be talking a bit more about uh, leks and how the prairie chickens utilize those. 
and with some photographs I'm sure that you'll be sharing with us on prairie chickens, the long feathers that normally lay along the neck of the male prairie chicken which are raised during courtship and they look like ears and they are called pinae. So how'd you do with your quiz? Good, good. I heard lots of goods. Ten. Yay. All right. Uh, I think we want to slip to two slides down now, Betsy. Pass the prairie chicken. There we go. All right. So Michelle Brocious, our board member and field trip co-coordinator, has lots of things to chat with us about. Hi, Michelle. How are you doing this evening? Hi, Nancy. I'm doing great. Thank you. Uh, next slide, good. please, Betsy. All right, so I'm going to talk with you today about the second Saturday bird walk report, and then I'm going to uh, talk about the virtual field trips, both last month and this month, and then uh, some social distancing birding guidelines. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so in-person activities, including our bird walks, continue to be canceled to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Uh, however, Bill Dininger and Dave Grass Kemper are still going out for the canceled second Saturday bird walks to collect bird survey data for eBird. On the January 2021 second Saturday bird walk, the weather was cold, reaching a high of 33 degrees, but it was sunny the entire walk. 20 species were observed that day. A red-bellied woodpecker is put on a show, three or four being vocal and chasing each other for several minutes. There was also a group of 14 house finch perched in a tree. Three bluebirds were also feeding low in the ground with their blue feathers glowing in the sunshine and a pileated woodpecker was also seen flying over the marsh. Oh, next slide, please. All right, last month our virtual field trip was at the Ohio and Erie Canal Reservation to see the bald eagle. At least five participants visited the park throughout the month. I am currently compiling the bird list, journaling, and photos submitted to me into a digital scrapbook. So if you haven't sent me your items, please get those over to me by end of day Friday, uh, February 5th. I will then present the scrapbook at our virtual meetup next week on Wednesday, February 10th at 7 p.m. And even if you didn't have a chance to visit uh, the park last month, you are still more than welcome to attend the virtual meetup in which I will share the scrapbook for discussion. All right, next slide, please. All right, February's virtual field trip takes place at Bradley Woods Reservation in Westlake, where we will be looking for black capped chickadees. This location is considered a swamp forest and includes a walking path around a lake and over two miles of hiking trails. During your visits to the park, I encourage you to do any of the following activities. You can take photographs, draw a picture, or create art inspired by what you've seen, tally identified species, journal your thoughts, or create a poem or a haiku. Uh, send your items to me and your contribution will be published to a digital scrapbook and shared on our website and on social media. Uh, we will also have an optional virtual meetup to share our experiences and take a look at the scrapbook. You can get more information and register for this virtual field trip by visiting our website, wcaudubon.org, and clicking the February 2021 virtual field trip tile on the home page. All right, next slide, please. And then finally, um, as you get out there to bird and enjoy nature during the pandemic, we encourage you to take precautions by limiting your group size to 10 people or less, staying six feet apart from others, not in your household, traveling separately, uh, wearing a face mask and washing your hands or using a high alcohol hand sanitizer. All right, thank you for your attention today. Uh, back to you, Nancy. Thanks so much, Michelle. I hope everybody's been paying close attention to these beautiful photographs that are accompanying the bullet points and the information that Michelle has, has shared with us. Uh, I think all of them that uh, were shown are, were taken by Michelle. She's become quite the photographer, and uh, so uh, I, I hope you're appreciating those. They're really, really beautiful. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, next, please. And Gloria, how are you doing this evening, Gloria? Well, um, I'm doing okay, okay. Nancy. All right. There's um, a lot that Gloria is going to be chatting about, so I'm going to say, take it away, Gloria. Okay. All right. Next slide, please, Betsy. Okay. Um, 
what I'm going to be discussing tonight is our garden, Guardians of Nature group and who we are and what we do and how we advise um, the board members uh, so that they have a broader uh, expanse of things that are happening in the uh, bird world. So I'll be talking about that and specifically junior membership, which is something new that we've uh, instituted for this year. Also included with that is a Saturday Youth Story and Activity Hour, and I'm hoping that some of you will join us after I talk. And then um, our NAS Collaborative Grant and the January photography winner and the contest for February. I'll be announcing that. So next slide, um, Betsy. Our Guardians of Nature meets twice a month, um, Thursday, two Thursdays, the third and fourth of every month. And um, it's not, you can opt in and out. You can come one one week and then the next month you can opt out and come back and also we have several people who don't come to the meetings but they are helping us offline or online with the things that we are developing. Next slide please. Now this is one of the things that we are developing and it's called the Junior Guardians of Nature. So what we have decided that we thought it might be a good thing to do is because we all want to uh, have a legacy and keep uh, our Audubon chapters uh, going after we have long left the building. So we're trying to foster getting younger kids involved by having a uh, Saturday meetup where they discuss different things and we also uh, have a membership for them for $20. We think it's a really good uh, gift for our uh, grandparent or aunt or uncle to give if they know one of their nieces, nephews, or grandkids want uh, to learn more about the natural world. So um, that is what we are about at the Guardians of Nature at this point. We're, we're working on that. Next slide, Betsy. Part of that is that we applied. Uh, Mary Ann Romito, board member, alerted Nancy Howell and I to the uh, $1,000 collaborative grant from Nat National Audubon Society. And I'm really proud to announce that we received one. And our um, reasons for doing this was that we wanted to develop the programming for Junior and Guardians of Nature. We wanted to uh, bring uh, youth from different neighborhoods, some that are underserved uh, and others that may um, not have that uh, designation, but they also, we want to have a diverse and audience that they can discuss different things in their backyards, in their parks, and the natural world around them. So the funds are going to be used mostly for activity bags that will include a uh, pair of binoculars, a sketch bag, uh, a sketch pad, colored pencils, a bird guide, and some activity sheets of the things that we'll be doing throughout uh, the coming months. So each uh, child who uh, signs up for to be a Guardians of Nature, we will uh, be also providing these activity bags. There will be virtual pre presentations and we need volunteers. So if you have a certain thing that you really, if it's bird ID or if it's native plants in your gardens, in your backyard to uh, feed birds and other wildlife, or if you have an interest in insects, um, anything that you might want, it might be a good idea to come to the Guardians of Nature's meetings uh, in February and um, discuss your ideas and maybe get on our calendar 
for a program uh, for kids. Now, if you're worried about it, well, I don't know whether I have an hour. Uh, we've decided that we're going to kind of maybe uh, meld people together. If there might be two people that like the same things, but it's a diff little different, they'll be together. So just come, see what we're doing, and see if you'd like to help out. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so here's what we've been waiting, uh, waiting for is our January bird of the month, and that was a black-capped chickadee. And our winner is um, Francis Anine from, uh, in from Indiana. Uh, this is our first out-of-state uh, winner. And her, she named her photo Black Cat Chickadee Confused by its Shadow. And um, so we had more participants every month. We're having more people enter the contest. And it makes it really interesting for the um, judges because they all like aspects of every single photo that people bring in. And it's, it's very, very difficult to pick that winner. But anyway, congratulations, Francis, and I will be uh, contacting you by email and asking um, where we, how we should deliver your uh, prize. So, um, next slide. That may be my last slide. I'm not sure. No, this is the, my announcement for the February photo contest. This month, is going to be the bald eagle. Bald eagles are beginning to nest and starting to prepare for their um, uh, chicks this spring. So um, it's a good time to go to the national park or um, other places like uh, Maggie is a, another place. There's a lot of, of bald eagles and almost any river anymore has uh, a nesting pair or two. So it's a good month to go out and look for bald eagles and snap that photo and enter our contest. So, and I want to thank you for your um, participation and it's great to see the number of people here. Um, cold weather puts us right into the idea of let's 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 have a meeting, let's get together, and it may be virtual, but still great. And uh, hope you think about entering a photo. I think I'm finished, Nancy. So I think it's back to you. Thanks so much, Gloria. Yep, there's always so much going on, and uh, eagles. You know, I remember when I was younger, eagles were very difficult to find in Ohio. But just about anywhere, as Gloria said, any river, the lake, um, marsh areas, you're going to find some eagles. So uh, good luck out there. Oh, Kurt Miskey, one of our board members, has some exciting news as well, too. Hi, Kurt. How are you doing this evening? I'm well, Nancy, and greetings to everyone. Uh, when my okay. mother died last year, I used some of the uh, inheritance money to start the Gene E. Miskey Memorial Fund, and we're using that uh, for WCAS to help fund uh, the Bluebird Box project that we've come up with. Next slide, please. So there are several decrepit Bluebird Boxes located in the area of the Lewis Road riding rink off Lewis Road. Uh, that's WCA, I'm sorry, that's Metro Parks property. So I went to Metro Parks and said, hey, we want to replace these decrepit things. And they agreed to let us put up four, probably five new boxes and the old ones will be removed. They will tell us where they want them, so location is up to them. I'm not sure who's going to do installation yet. We're still working on that, if that will be volunteers or if that will be Metro Parks employees. One thing they were adamant about was that, okay, once the boxes are up, they have to be monitored, and you're going to do them. 
So we're recruiting volunteers to help in that endeavor. Uh, monitor, monitors will need to be trained and they will need to be registered with the Metro Parks. It's a process that I'm in the middle of. It doesn't seem too difficult. Uh, so we'll, we'll go from there. Next slide, please. So we're looking for contributions for this fund and we're going to match every, every dollar that's donated up to a, five, a total of 500 from our fund. So that will be a total of 1,000. Uh, and for details, you can go to the site listed here. If you go to the WCAS website, there's also an icon there, and you can click through and find the same thing or use the Donate button there. Uh, if anyone is interested in volunteering for this project, again, I don't know what installation is going to be. We do know we're going to be doing monitoring for sure. Uh, please contact me at the site here, the email address here, and that again is, is also on the website. Thank you. Back to you, Nancy. Thanks so much, Kurt. So I think a lot of you can already see we have a number of volunteer opportunities with Western Cuyahoga Audubon, whether it's working with the Junior Guardians of Nature, uh, doing either a virtual program or doing an activity, or uh, working with Kurt and the, the Bluebird Box uh, project. So uh, we hope that you can check out, again, the Western Cuyahoga Audubon website, www.wcaudubon.org, and uh, just look it through. There's just a lot of things going on. All right, uh, next slide, please, Betsy. Aha, here's our digital strategist, and she's got some exciting news as well, too. I'm going to let you take it away, Betsy. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I'd like to just sort of give everyone the update on uh, live, the live wildlife programs that WCAS is co-hosting uh, each month, pretty much. Uh, and this month, the month of February, we're partnering with um, Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. Uh, the center is providing the program and uh, WCIS is helping to host uh, them online and together we're working together to collaborate to get the word out uh, and uh, invite people um, about the program. Uh, we're working with the two presenters. There's uh, Tim Jasinski, uh, wildlife, wildlife Rehabilitation Specialist on the left, and Christine Barnett, who is a Wildlife Program Specialist. And we had our first program yesterday for the month of February. They're on Mondays at noon, and it's just really great. Uh, you can watch recorded programs on our website, wcaudubon.org, and also on social media and definitely on the WCAS YouTube channel. You can find all the programs there as well as other past programs with wildlife rehabilitation centers. Uh, and their programming. I just want to give you a quick idea. This is a, a list, but you can get this list on our website at the news blog and on social media. And you can just sort of see um, the uh, breadth of topics uh, and everything from how to make lifelong connections with wildlife, which was yesterday, uh, to uh, how does plastic pollution uh, affect wildlife, uh, bird life and then the, the last one although it'll be a little early for baby birds but uh, we will be talking about them uh, do baby birds really need our help now I thought you would enjoy this wonderful uh, photograph uh, that was taken I think maybe last year or within the last two years uh, and this was um, taken for a field trip at Lake Erie Nature and Science Center which is located on the near well, Bay Village, the west side of the greater Cleveland uh, metropolitan area. And the center has so many amenities. And one of the things that it does have is it's immediately adjacent to the Huntington Reservation, a reservation and part of the Cleveland Metro Parks. Uh, so here is a, a, a really look, looks like an enthusiastic birding group. 
um, about ready to go on their bird trip, their bird walk um, from the center straight uh, through the Huntington Reservation and then on to the lake probably. Uh, simultaneously with each of these months of wildlife programs, we also uh, collaborate with the centers to um, um, help get the word out about uh, donating, asking, the, inviting the public to donate to uh, help continue to support these essential services uh, uh, in wherever, whatever community you're in. Um, so we like to say wildlife rehabilitation specialists are some of today's unsung heroes and heroines, and they really are working under tremendous pressure uh, today, they continue to aid and assist injured wildlife despite the crippling effects of climate change that is now compounded by the social and economic complications of COVID. For example, um, as you, probably all of us, now that we're a little more experienced with COVID, we understand how hard it is to not only recruit volunteers, but to carry out activities uh, with them. Uh, because of the uh, COVID um, social distancing requirements. So all of these centers that help us to bridge um, the conflicts that might occur between human populations and wildlife, be it in urban areas or in rural, it's really important that now uh, more than ever, we help to support them. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Betsy. That was a lot of information. And yes, the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center and their Wildlife Rehab Center does a fabulous job. Um, I've seen some wonderful things on Facebook of pretty severely injured critters, and they have just done spectacularly well. So uh, 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 kudos to them. Now, Amanda Sobrowski is the founder of the Northeast Ohio Chimney Swift Conservation, uh, and she has a lot of information uh, coming up um, locally as well as uh, in a little, um, a little distance away. So, Amanda, take it away. Hi, thanks. Um, I think we all know that chimney swifts are great partners for humans. They eat so many insects that really bug us. They literally spend most of their life on the wing catching insects the size of mosquitoes and midges. Um, I think we, you may have read that um, since the 70s, about 70% 70 of the bird population has fallen, and that includes chimney swifts. There's um, several reasons why this is happening, but one of them is habitat loss as forests have disappeared and the chimneys that they adapted to using are now being capped or no longer built. Um, and in the fall, as swifts amass for migration to the South America, they create mesmerizing aerial displays as the swifts go to roost in the evenings. Um, we can help build more habitats by um, replacing um, any chimneys that are lost with towers or protecting standing chimneys as is being done in um, Bethesda, Pennsylvania. Um, next slide. Thanks. Um, Bethesda just made a resolution to make chimney swifts their official bird. And uh, Lehigh Valley ought Audubon Society, which is out in that area, is fundraising to help keep a chimney um, that's in Bethesda for the Masonic Temple um, from being torn down or to build a replacement. The chimney um, is occupied by thousands of Swiss, so it would be a real loss if they weren't able to uh, either replace or retain the chimney that's already there. Uh, next slide. Um, John Noble owns the Masonic Temple and is also the developer. And he's pledged to save the old chimney as he tears down the um, temple. And if he can't save it, then he's going to uh, try to build another 
um, brick chimney at, in the vicinity. Um, if you see, change it to the next slide, you'll see how extensive the um, whole project is. So you can see it's a really big building, and the chimney that um, it has all the chimney swifts, you can see they're kind of uh, on the right third. Um, next slide, please. The cost is about $50,000, and as I said, um, the Lehigh Valley Audubon Society is has started this GoFundMe called Save Our Swifts. Um, so far, they raised about $7,000. They're trying to get it all raised by April. So um, I'm hoping that some of you will go to their uh, GoFundMe site and contribute whatever you can to help them reach their goal so they can um, save or replace this chimney. If you'd uh, rather um, contribute to building uh, towers in Northeastern Ohio, you can go to uh, wcaudubon.org and select that Chimney Swifts Projects button. Uh, so far we've uh, built or contributed to three um, towers. We were hoping to have more by now, but then COVID hit. Um, so we're hoping to get back on track after uh, we can all get out and about a bit. Thank you. Thanks so much, Amanda. That's a lot of information. And uh, uh, I can't wait for the chimney swifts to come back. That means it'll be spring. So yeah. Yeah, that, I, yeah, it'll be fun. Thanks so much. All right, I've got a couple more quick announcements. Next, Betsy. Uh, yes, we do have a fundraiser for Western Cuyahoga, and if you want to hit the, the next slide, uh, Betsy, we are selling $10 denomination gift certificates for Mitchell's Homemade Ice Cream. Um, again, all the proceeds that will go to Western Cuyahoga Audubon. Um, not only do you, does Mitchell have uh, ice cream, but they have frozen yogurt, sorbet, and even vegan ice cream. So uh, you can purchase those through the, uh, through the uh, WCAS store and then also find out where the uh, uh, different Mitchell's ice cream stores are. I know people say, well, I don't want to eat ice cream in the winter time. Well, guess what? It's not going to be winter time forever. Plus, Plus, you know, you want to buy maybe something for a, for a nephew, a grandkid, uh, you know, what a fun thing. Uh, you know, Valentine's Day, oh, that's coming up. So, yeah, think about think about those types of things too. So, uh, love to have your uh, your uh, funds raised for Western Cuyahoga Audubon. Uh, next, please. Uh, Karu, hi Karu, how are you? Hi, I'm Groot. Thank you for good, joining good. us today, everyone. Yeah, what so, you have to uh, today? Ah, thank you. So, go to the next slide, please. Ah, I'm a Kaoru Tsubone board member and uh, joining uh, uh, bird friendly native plants community. Uh, we had a native plant sale in 2019. It was successful. Uh, unfortunately, we di didn't have it last year, but uh, why don't we do it again in 2020? And now we are recruiting uh, volunteers. Uh, and also we are looking for where to sell native plants. So if you are uh, interested in uh, joining uh, as a volunteer or uh, if you want to share your idea about your native plant cell, please uh, uh, reach me and or just uh, uh, contact your WCAS. Uh, that's it. Very good. Thank you so much, Karu. All right, next slide. We get more volunteer opportunities. Uh, I want to mention our next month's program will feature me as a presenter and the beautiful, beautiful videos of Bill Deininger. Some of you may have seen Bill's videos, but we're really being selective. 
the theme is, what is that bird doing? And we're really going to focus on feeding behaviors. So we hope that you can join us on Tuesday, March 2nd, and we'll run through a number of Bill's videos and talk about uh, some of the different feeding behaviors of birds. Um, I think you'll really, really enjoy it. And this could be part of a, a larger section of, of programming that we'll be doing about what is that bird doing. This is just going to be the beginning. But well, we want to be, uh, we want to get into our uh, program this evening. And our this evening's presenter is Dr. Jackie Augustine. And uh, she's the uh, recently became the executive director with Audubon of Kansas. Uh, Dr. Augustine is a behavioral ecologist studying the mating behaviors of birds. While getting her doctorate degree at Kansas State University, she fell in love with the prairie chicken and has been studying them for about well, almost two decades. Her current research utilizes robots to study how males attract mates in greater and lesser prairie chickens, two declining species whose ranges overlap in western Kansas. Another project is determining whether drones can be used for uh, surveying for prairie chickens. So please give a warm, warm welcome to Dr. Jackie Augustine and Robots and Drones for Science, not just science fiction. Thank you so much, Jackie, for joining us this evening. I can't wait. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Western Cuyahoga. It's great to give this presentation tonight. And so, yeah, and just some background, uh, you know, for the past uh, 11 years, I've been teaching biology at Ohio State Lima. Um, but I've been studying prairie chickens for longer than that. I got my PhD studying them. I, I studied um, greater prairie chickens and sharp-tailed grouse in Minnesota, and then really fell in love with these um, display areas where you have two species displaying. And then I, I moved out to western Kansas for my research and been studying greater and lesser prairie chickens for last, you know, uh, almost, almost 20 years now. It's kind of hard to imagine that. Um, and so I'm going to be talking about the the thing I'm so passionate about is uh, prairie chickens and a little bit about the research I do. Um, I'm also the president of the Council of Ohio Audubon chapters um, and so I'll be um, so I, I'm active in Ohio. Um, my term will be ending at the end of June. Um, and then um, now and until then, I'm, I'm the executive director of Audubon of Kansas. And that's a really great opportunity for me to save these prairie chickens that I've been studying for so long. So anyway, the presentation I'm going to be showing tonight is my research presentation um, that I conducted while I was at Ohio State Lima. And so that's why it's branded Ohio State University, even though I'm at um, the um, uh, Audubon of Kansas right now. And so uh, I'm going to start off by talking about my robot research, and then I'll finish up with the drone research, and there'll be plenty of prairie chicken biology thrown in. And so please you know, ask questions in the chat box or um, save them for the end, and um, I'll answer them sooner or later. So thank you very much. Um, so let's get started. Okay, so stunning behaviors is wonderful. You get to see, here's a house wren. It fed the, um, so the house wren flew in, it sang, and it fed the female inside the box, and they both flew off together. And you can learn a lot by studying natural behaviors and just taking observations. And so, you know, a video like this, I can, you know, learn you know, how many times the male feeds in an hour. Um, if I, they're color banded, I can see how many times the male feeds versus the female and how much time they spend in the box. And I can get a lot of information from that. And so, you know, this is a, a great way to study bird behavior. But I'm really just, you know, taking observations and kind of imagining why the birds are doing the things they're doing. But once I have an idea uh, and reason that I think is, um, you know, that the birds are acting a certain way, scientists then want to make an experiment. Like, okay, 
um, if this is occurring, then if I do this, something else will happen. And so conducting experiments um, has a long history in behavioral research. And these are just two examples I, I took off the web. Um, here they were showing a model mount um, of a white crowned sparrow in the territory. And, and that's great because you can see whether a visual stimulus uh, elicits a certain behavioral response from the focal bird, or you can use models or song. And that's what's being shown in the lower uh, video. You have a speaker there that's playing a song sparrow song. And you can see the song sparrow is attacking the speaker because it's trying to um, get the, the intruder off its territory. And so this is great. These showing models and playing songs is great for most songbirds. Usually you can display your model or play the song on one bird's territory and then go to another bird's territory and repeat the thing and you know get all these data points about how birds react to the model or the song. But it's a little bit more challenging when you're studying something like a prairie chicken. Um, and so I turned towards robots. And robots are really cool. You're like, I mean, who doesn't want to play with a robot that looks like a bird and interact with, I mean, can you imagine bird watching? You sometimes just want to interact with the birds that you're seeing. And this is a way you can kind of do that. And so um, there's one researcher, Gail Patricelli, um, at the University of California, Davis, that has been doing this a long time. She started out um, working with bowerbirds in Australia, but is now working on uh, greater sage grouse. And she has these robotic chickens, and um, not, not chickens, but robotic sage grouse females, and she you know, puts them out there and watches how the males respond to the female's behavior. So I thought, well, this is great. Um, and especially for prairie chickens where you get a bunch of them gathered in one area. And so prairie chickens, they're found in the central United States along the Great Plains. Um, they're most numerous in Kansas, uh, Nebraska, South Dakota, Oklahoma, all throughout there. Um, but one thing, if you've never experienced prairie chickens that's so cool about them, is that the males will gather and they form these uh, display areas that we call leks, L-E-K. Um, and these leks, um, the males display and the females will come and so the, there's three males pictured on the right here and the female on the left and they're all displaying for this female, trying to get the female's attention. And for my PhD research, I wanted to know why, you know, females chose particular males. And in fact, most females choose one or two of the males, even though there might be 10 or 12 males out there, most of the females will only choose one or two of them, and the same one or two over and over. Um, and so they're very unanimous in their decisions about which male is sexy. And so I looked at that for my PhD. Um, and so, yeah, I, I was like, what makes that male so sexy? Uh, the moral of that story is that it's testosterone, but also aggressive behavior um, that the females really cue in on. Um, and like I said, the females are really uh, unanimous of what decision. So about 9% of the males get 76% of all the copulations. And this is data from one lack or one breeding area in one year. And males are just ranked on the y-axis based on the number of copulations they received. And so you can see that, um, you know, three males, three, four males got most of the copulations and over half of the males, even though they were there every day and they looked superficially the same, um, did not get a female at all during the entire season. And so this is, um, you know, one of the things that got me interested in, in studying prairie chickens. Um, and yeah, like I said, the, the, Moral of the story is it's testosterone, a little bit about um, their size, like bigger birds, birds with a, a larger comb above their eyes. So I'm sure you saw in the pictures, they have an orange fleshy thing, kind of um, like the, the cock on a chicken or the comb on a chicken, that fleshy area above the eye. They like larger ones of those and those closer to the center of the area. Um, behavior was also important, but not as important as testosterone. So anyway, that was my PhD. Uh, but then after I graduated, I started wondering, well, 
on the male's perspective, you know, they're spending a lot of time and energy, um, you know, trying to attract the female, and some of them are not successful. So is it worth it? And so this is gave me an idea of, like, well, do males also have a strategy? And this is where I turn to the robots. Um, and if males have a strategy, you should be able to see it when the two different species, greater and lesser prairie chicken, have their ranges overlapping. And so I know this is a complicated map. Um, so the, the blue distribution is the graders, with the lightest color being their maximum extent and the dark color being where they are now. Um, the lesser prairie chicken is um, shown in red. And so I studied these birds in western Kansas where there's both greater and lesser prairie chickens. And this is a great place to study whether males have a strategy because it would behoove them to mate with their own species, right? And because hybrid birds, uh, or at least hybrid males, do not get any mates. And so you have zero grandchildren, if you will, if you mate with the wrong species. And so um, males should have a strategy in western Kansas in that they, dis they should be displaying more intensely to their own species. Um, Here's the, the two birds I'm studying, and yes, they look very similar. Um, if you have a greater and lesser, and you might guess which one is which. Uh, the right one is the greater. Graters are greater in size, um, so they weigh about 1,000 grams. Lessers weigh about 800 grams. Um, you can see the plumage is also different. Graters have darker dark bars and whiter white bars, whereas lessers are a little bit more faded looking. Um, and the one thing you cannot see in this slide is that they also differ in the color of their air sac. So some of the slides will show that there is um, a, an orange or a red coloration in their throat. So lesser prairie chickens have a red color in their throat and graters have an orange color. Um, the grid stake you see in the back is just how I map out territories of the males. Okay, so the objective of this study is kind of um, has a, a kind of complicated. So, if display and aggressive behavior is costly, and by costly I mean that it takes a lot of energy. If you're doing display and aggressive behavior at the display site, you can't be off eating or loafing or lounging or you know hiding from predators. Um, so there is a cost associated with showing up at a lek and displaying um, to females. So if it's costly, and males are able to discriminate between well, these are fancy words, conspecific and heterospecific. Conspecific just means your same species. Heterospecific just means the other species. So if you can differentiate between greater and lesser females, then males should intensify their behavior in the presence of females of their own species. So that's what I went about testing, and that's why I turned to robots. Um, chose robots because um, both graders and lessers, lessers more so, um, but they're both declining species. There's only about 40,000 lesser prairie chickens left and about 400,000 graders. So graders are doing better, but they're both species of concern. So I didn't want to disturb them. You know, so I could have put out a model, just a static taxidermy mount, and saw what the birds did, but then to get that model back and to put it in another male's territory, I would have to flush all the birds and move it and then get back. You know, and so I didn't want to disturb them. And also I'm working with this lek mating species. So monogamous species, um, generally the territories may be in visual sight of each other, but um, they might not be looking all the time. <laughs> Whereas um, you see all those birds out in the open, they can all see each other and see what everyone's doing. And so, um, and so yeah, I wanted to use those robots so that I could, I could have the bird go amongst a bunch of territories at once. And I also wanted to present two robots. So again, if I was presenting two different mounts, a greater female and a lesser female, um, 
you know, I would have to flush the birds a lot of time. And so, um, yeah, so again, robots is our, our ideal because I can send one out and then send the other one out um, and not cause all this disturbance. And finally, I thought this would be a good way that I could spend quality time with my husband and also uh, get some work done at the same time. Um, my husband flies radio-controlled airplanes, I skin birds, so this seemed like a great opportunity to put our two hobbies together. Um, and by the way, bird skinning is um, how birds are prepared for museums. And so I would skin birds so that we would have specimens for students to look at and learn from. Okay, constructing the robot. Here is um, kind of the guts of the chassis. So we have these four wheels. We have a motherboard here that controls it. We have motors associated with each wheel and then a speed controller. Um, then we also had the taxidermy part. Um, you can buy taxidermy mannequins off the internet and then I layered them with fiberglass and chopped out the middle and so I had a place to put the battery. And I'm sorry this, if this grosses you out, just look away for a second. Um, so here is the, the back of the skull. I put a servo in the skull, so this is going to um, turn the head. I have a glass taxidermy eye, some clay to hold it in place, and then um, the skin of the specimen there. And so I put that back over the bird. Here's the bottom, so you can see the servo a little bit better. And finally, I did this four times, so I had two lesser females and two greater females. And this is really important because it could be they were just, you know, something funky about the taxidermy mount I prepared and so they didn't respond. Um, but here I can figure out if they responded because of the identity of the female or, and not just the particular mount I was using. And so this is my first attempt. And I thought the hard part was going to be making the model, but the hard part was actually running the robot with the birds. You can see my first attempt out there, I got stuck in the grass and the male was not impressed and in fact flew away. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to show these videos and then I'll kind of explain what you're supposed to see. I know the videos don't always um, go well over the internet, so uh, just bear with me. Okay, the next video um, was a successful um, attempt. What I did after this failed attempt is I bought lots of one foot rolls of carpeting at um, Lowe's and Home Depot and I made like a racetrack out there. I thought I would be able to visit um, every mail at, um, and kind of weave throughout the territories but I found out that um, that it was really hard to keep the female on the track at the far end of the display area. And so now I just have a straight line out um, so I can easily maneuver my bird out and it comes back and I can um, cross three or four male territories in one morning. Okay, so here is a successful video. You'll see the female and you'll see the male displaying. Um, and so, yeah, it works. There it goes. And if you look closely, you can see the, the female's head move. And this is a, a lesser prairie chicken displaying towards the female. And if you're an astute observer, you, you heard the pop, pop, pop of the lesser prairie chicken, but also the boom, boom of the greater prairie chicken. And so, yeah, these birds do display in the same area. Here's another video, and this bird was a little too interested in the female <laughs> and knocked it over. Um, and so, yeah, sometimes the birds are really interested and, um, you know, when this happens, I would have to flush the, all the birds, set the female back up, run back to my blind. Um, 
but usually that um, you know they would come back within five or ten minutes. Okay, and then I think the last video is showing um, just kind of my setup. So you'll see the robot out there, and then you'll see kind of what it looks like in the blind. So you can see the robot, the two birds displaying, the carpet that comes back to the blind. Here I am in the blind. There's the camera that I'm recording the bird behavior and the transmitter. Okay, so I'm a scientist and I love tables. So here, here's our um, first figures. And so just to orient you, don't get don't get shell shocked. <laughs> so we have the greater prairie chicken on the top, um, and then a measurement of aggression and a measurement of display. And when a greater prairie chicken is displaying towards its own species, it displays at a greater rate, or it is more aggressive with its own species than with a different species. What's interesting is that lesser prairie chickens are also more aggressive when a greater prairie chicken female is present. And so this is interesting. We did not find any differences in display. Excuse me. <coughs> we did not find any differences in the display. <coughs> Don't want to cough into the microphone. There we go. Um, so it seems that both greater and lesser prairie chickens are more aggressive when greater females are present. And so this is an interesting uh, result, and we're still trying to figure out why that might be. So the conclusion of the robot part of this research is that male prairie chickens seem to adjust their aggressive behavior in response to the presence of their own species or another species. So um, because we saw differences with regards to whether it's a female greater or a female lesser, um, it does suggest that they can tell females apart and that they do respond or adjust their behavior accordingly. And again, um, you know, this shows that robots could be used if playback or models cannot answer your research question. Um, the learning curve is steep uh, because, you know, I tried a couple years before I got those robots to work and for the males to respond to them. Um, there's opportunities for interdisciplinary collaboration. It was really great. Um, I forgot to mention that the the chassis for the robot was constructed by engineering students, and they made the um, dimensions as I needed it. And new technologies are opening up uh, other research opportunities, and I'll be talking about another one of those um, here. So switching gears, this part is not as detailed <laughs> as um, uh, the previous one. But drones are becoming so much more common, and they offer a really unique opportunity to study wildlife. And they come in lots of different shapes and sizes. And of course, we usually think about drones as taking excellent photography, um, but there's lots of other applications. Here's one um, that is, you know, spot sparing pesticides or herbicides where it's needed. Um, and then, of course, wildlife research. And so um, we've been finding out that drones are really great for looking at um, animals in open habitats. If they're in a forest, it doesn't work so well. But I thought prairie chickens would be a great species to try. Um, so I'm testing the feasibility of using drones to detect prairie chicken populations. And so I can't just fly the drones over you know, where there's no prairie chickens where I, or where I don't know if there's prairie chickens or not. Because if I don't see any prairie chickens on the video, I don't know if that's because there were no prairie chickens present or if the video just couldn't detect it. So what I did to test the feasibility of this is fly drones over known prairie chicken spots. I had someone in a blind counting the birds there. And then I had, um, and then we also counted the birds on the video and see if they matched. Um, so, you know, to do this, 
currently, um, prairie chickens are being surveyed with helicopters. And helicopter surveys are A, expensive, but it also um, poses a significant risk to researchers um, because you're flying low over the prairie and accidents happen, right? And so drones offer an opportunity to, um, to get the same data, but at a, a, a cheaper cost. So I flew three different drones, uh, big, medium, and little, at three different heights with three different camera angles to try and determine which flight pattern is best for detecting prairie chickens. And here's the video. You can see a microphone in the middle. Um, and the birds flew away. What surprised me is that the birds flew away no matter what drone I used or what height, the birds always flew away. Um, and so that was a, a video from the ground. And now I want to show a video from the air. OK, so to orient you here, here's the blind. The prey chickens are going to be to the right of the blind. And you should see them flush very soon. There you see some. And here's another video. On um, this one, the camera angle is more straight down. And what I did then is I kind of um, put circles where all the birds started flying from. And that way, I could you know, tell and make sure that I counted all of them. And there they flew. And so yeah, they're. They're hard to see, but you can see with a large group of birds flying away, that's prairie chickens. And, I, and again, the surprising thing is they always flushed. I had this hope that I could just fly a drone over them, and they would sit there and ignore it, and I could map out territories and see if there were females visiting. But um, they always flushed, no matter which height I flew or which drone. Um, the Matrice is the largest one, the Inspire is the medium one, and the Mavic is the small one. And you can see the higher I flew, um, the less likely they're the flush, but you can see lots of conference, uh, very large conference intervals. And so they, they almost always flushed. But that was kind of good because we were able to see the birds that were flushed. And there was only one or two videos where we saw a bird when it did not flush or fly away. Um, and again, it seemed like the the best uh, drone to use was the small drone flown at the highest height. And that's kind of anti-intuitive. You'd think, well, isn't closer better? Well, actually, farther or and higher is better because there was a wider field of view. And so we were could see a wider area and we could see more birds. And then a 10% uh, or a 10 degree camera angle, so 10 degrees below the horizon, um, because most of the birds flushed before the, the drone actually got to the display area. And so here, the big findings are prairie chickens flush every time. Again, that was unexpected. Um, 100 meters with the smallest drone at a 10 degree camera angle was best. Um, I'm interested to see if fixed wing, if the birds would respond the same way to fixed wing drones. It kind of makes sense that the prairie chickens flush every time because their biggest predator is, are aerial predators like hawks and um, you know peregrine falcons and you know other things. Uh, harriers actually harass them quite a bit, um, and so uh, avian predators are a big problem for males on the lek, and so um, I'm wondering if they would respond differently to a fixed string drone. And of course, there's the, the challenge of public perception. There was one landowner that you know, I called to ask permission, and I said, oh yeah, by the way, I'm doing a drone study this year. Is it OK if I fly drones over your area? And he's like, well, I'm glad you told me, because we said we would shoot down any drones we ever saw. So. Um, there is that public perception about invading privacy that um, needs to be overcome. And of course, there's federal-like regulations. 
Um, right now, um, you have to apply for a special waiver to fly beyond the line of sight. Um, and so if you're surveying new areas, um, you know, you may want to fly your drone beyond the line of sight, but um, currently that's prohibited or restricted. So that's it. I'd like to thank you all for um, listening to this presentation. I'd also like to thank um, David Birchfield and the 2018 Kansas State um, Data Acquisition and Analysis class that helped do the drone surveys. So thanks for your attention. Thanks so much, Jackie. Yeah, that was great. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, but if you unmute uh, and have a question, um, please do. Uh, we'll try to keep it so not people aren't talking over each other. Any any questions out there? I know somebody's trying to ask a question. It's not coming through very well, though. Um, maybe, let's see if we type it in. I think somebody did type in a question here. Um, nope. Well, I have a question. I'm going to raise my paw. Um, you mentioned uh, helicopter surveys. Um, the birds didn't flush with the helicopters? No, they always flush with the helicopter surveys as well. But that okay. kind of makes more sense since they're so large. And, yeah, uh, okay. But I really didn't expect them to flush with the drones. Have you thought about camouflaging the drones as to not a raptor, but something that's a little bit more, I don't know, a gall or something like that? Because I have seen a drone that's in the, I've seen a drone in the form of a hummingbird, you know, a big hummingbird. But, uh, but you know, maybe maybe they wouldn't flush if it looks like uh, something that's not a, a potential predator. Yeah, unfortunately, I think that they are really responding to the sound. Like the sound puts them on edge, and then, um, and so then they're like looking for it and then when they see it they fly away right away mm -hmm. so I, I wish I could kind of separate the sound from the drone um, to see if it is the sight or the sound or both of them together that the birds are, are flying away from but um, but yeah it's kind of hard to do that <laughs> again any questions out there Question, question? Anybody seen a chicken? You what did you mention, Jackie? I was going to say, has anybody seen a prairie chicken? I went yeah. to Effingham, Illinois. Yeah. It was awesome. <laughs> Jackie, what's next on your agenda? Um, I currently have a graduate student that is looking at foot stomping behavior and so she um, so their display is really intricate it starts out with this really rapid foot stomping and then they spread their wings and their tails and they emit that low booming vocalization or the pop um, but no one's really looked at that foot stomping behavior no one's really quantified it like you know how fast is it um, and I, I think they could stomp like 12 times per second. I mean, it's amazing oh <laughs> how many, how fast they can move their feet. And so anyway, I have a graduate student that's looking at, um, at the foot stomping behavior. Is it related to male-male competition or is it related to female mate choice? Um, and then she's also going to be looking at the bones and seeing what anatomical differences there are between males and females that allow males to do that rapid foot stomping behavior. Um, and so, yeah, right now I'm, uh, because my, my current job at, as Executive Director for Audubon of Kansas is not um, research, it's more doing environmental advocacy, so working with um, legislation, passing legislation, and then also managing a couple sanctuaries that Audubon of Kansas owns. Um, 
one of which has sharp-tailed grouse on it. Um, so anyway, I, I'm not pursuing it myself anymore. Have you actually uh, measured testosterone levels in the prairie chicken? I'm sorry, I'm reading your chat box. That's fine. That's good. There's the one above it, too. Oh, okay, good. Well, I didn't see the one above, so I'll ask this one. Um, yes, uh, so for my PhD, I did actually measure testosterone levels, um, and we did that in two different ways. Um, because testosterone levels can change so rapidly, um, as soon as I caught a bird in the trap, I would get a blood sample. Um, so we did it via blood samples, but then we also did it through fecal samples, and we found similar results so that more successful males had higher levels of testosterone in their blood and their feces than um, unsuccessful males. I'm sorry, I don't see the other question. Um, it, says, no, it says, what other studies will you be doing now that you're in Kansas? But it sounds as though you're, you kind of answered that because you're with uh, Audubon of Kansas, so you're doing more things. But will you continue doing some uh, research with prairie chickens or sharp-tailed grouse or whatever? Yeah, I'm actually not going to be continuing. There's a, a couple things that I have data for that I hope to publish. Um, and then, but yeah, mostly I'm going to be working with my last graduate student and and working on her research and that. So I won't be doing any more research myself. Um, but I'm so excited to be able to advocate on behalf of prairie chickens. I've been studying them so long, I feel like I want to do more than just learn about them. I want to do, you know, give back to them in any way I can. And so I'm, I'm really excited for working with private landowners to, um, you know, hopefully improve their habitat for prairie chickens and, um, you know, prevent further uh, human destruction of their habitat, and so I'm really excited to be able to do something for them after they've given me so much over the years. Uh, are wind turbines uh, an issue in open areas like Kansas, and you know what might, how might that affect uh, things like the grouse and chicken and the prairie chickens? Yeah, they're a big issue, actually. And we're not concerned about the prairie chickens being hit by the blades because they don't fly that high. They tend to fly lower to the ground. Um, but prairie chickens are are aptly named because they don't like anything taller than a prairie. <laughs> so they don't like trees. They avoid trees because trees are where predators hang out. Those hawks hang out looking for them. Um, so they avoid trees. They avoid power lines. So it's not just the turbines themselves. It's the high um, high energy power lines that come from those facilities. Um, lesser prairie chickens will not cross high energy power lines. Um, they just won't go over around them. Um, and so yeah, wind turbines are a big threat uh, to lesser prairie chickens in particular. The greater seem a little bit uh, more lax about, you know, look at a little bit closer, but there have been studies that show that they do avoid areas near the turbines. And so it's not that it's killing birds, but it's that the birds are um, avoiding habitats. And so um, in Kansas, we advocate for putting the wind turbines on agricultural lands and not the prairie. And of course, um, you know, 98% of the prairie has been destroyed. And so why further fragment it with um, turbines? Because each turbine requires a road to go up to it for maintenance. Um, and so it, you, yeah, you're losing a small percentage of habitat, but um, like lesser prairie chickens won't nest within a mile of a house and a half mile of a road. Um, and so they avoid human structures um, at all costs. Um, and so yeah, there's a lot of threats to prairie chickens. Wind energy development um, is one threat. Um, of course, further fragmentation of habitat through power lines, roads, urbanization. Um, Another big threat to prairie chickens is woody encroachment. Um, people are not managing their prairies with burning. Um, burning is an essential part of maintaining a prairie because it removes woody vegetation. And so that's a, another threat 
as well. So there's just so many threats to the poor prairie chickens. I just have a bazillion questions. So you, there has been hybridization between greater and lesser? Yeah, we call them guessers, right? <laughs> guessers. Um, the, we see males on the lek, uh, so they, they're about 1 to 3 percent of the population, so they're not common. Um, and it's kind of funny. So, the, you know, the lessers go pop, 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 and the graders go boom, boom. And the hybrids go, mah, mah. <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> in between those two. Um, and they're out, bless their hearts, they're out there just trying and displaying their little hearts out, but a female, like, just runs past them. Um, and so we've never seen a male hybrid successfully attract a female, even if <laughs> they are in the middle of the lek and they're doing all the right things. They, um, they're just off. Um, but we have seen a few birds, I say a few, I think one in the eight years I've been studying in western Kansas, um, that we thought was a back cross. So presumably it's a hybrid female that mated with a lesser male because like I said, males aren't as choosy as the females, and so um, they would mate with a hybrid, whereas the, a female would not mate with a hybrid male. Um, and so we did see one, what we believe is a back cross. We didn't do the genetics on that bird. Um, we just were not set up for that. Um, but it is presumably kind of a dead-end path, so if a hybridization event occurs. Um, and this past year, actually, I thought I saw a hybrid female. Um, females are harder to tell, greater and lesser, and so. But I was pretty darn sure I saw a hybrid. So anyway, um, they are out there, but they're not common. Another question came in. I don't know if you're looking at it. Are there any programs that are attempting to uh, reestablish or expand territories into other regions? Uh, Western Ohio. Unfortunately, I have not seen any areas in Ohio that could support a prairie chicken. Um, they need at least 40,000 acres of prairie habitat that is uninterrupted by roads or trees or people. <laughs> um, so um, there has been attempts of, um, so recently they've been moving lesser prairie chickens from western Kansas to southeastern Colorado um, but and they have tried moving greater prairie chickens in the past maybe about five years ago greater prairie chickens from Kansas to Missouri um, but the success of those programs are limited and so it's so I mean it's so hard to reestablish populations, but the good thing about managing for prairie chickens is that we know what they want. They want large tracts of intact grassland. Um, so we just have to figure out how to get that to them. All righty. I don't see any further questions, but let's give a nice round of applause. You can use your little reaction symbols. There you go. A little clapping. Yay! Thank you so much, Jackie. We really appreciate it and the videos and your research and all the best in Kansas. Great. Thank you and thanks everybody for listening. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much. We'll see you next month, if not earlier, with some of our other programs. Thanks again.